Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's definitely spring and here come the strawberries. Today we are preserving that great strawberry taste with some freezer jam. Also, want to see more creatures in your garden? Plant a wildlife friendly garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Kathy Fouts. Ms. Kathy is a UT Extension agent right here in Shelby County. And Tanya Ashworth is here. Tanya is our local garden expert. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You. I love strawberries. Strawberries are my favorite. I can't wait to taste them. Ms. Okay. Kathy, you know well, that? we'll go ahead and get started, Chris. As you know, we get a lot of calls around this time of year. Okay. I want to make strawberry jam, but I don't want to use the water bath. I just want to can them, put them in the freezer. So we did a little bit of research. All of these recipes call for a tremendous amount of sugar. Okay. And we're trying to cut down on our sugar. So I purchased this low sugar pectin. And we're gonna make about less than two pints this morning. But you wanna use your freshest strawberries mm -hmm. possible. And the farmer's market is open. So you That's can get your fresh, beautiful strawberries at the farmer's market. Or you can grow your own strawberries, yes, which is done you here. Can. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that you sure have and go ahead and stem them and then crack, mash them in a single layer using a potato masher. Okay. Now some people say, well why'd you, why can't you just put it in a blender? I'm afraid that if you puree the strawberries, it's like baby food. Oh, so we okay. say that you just mash them with the potato masher and we're gonna put them in this small pot. Now I know you're thinking, she's not making very much jam. This is going to be less than two pints, but that's okay because I just wanted to demonstrate to this, uh, demonstrate quickly how this works. So we're gonna turn up our heat and two one and a third cups of berries, that's what okay, we have, one and a third is. cups of berries, and according to the pectin instructions, about one and a half tablespoons of low sugar pectin. Low sugar. And what does the pectin do, Ms. Kay? Oh, this is what causes the strawberry jam to gel. To gel. Mm -hmm. And sugar is also important in causing the strawberry jam to, to gel. So we're gonna stir this, we're gonna stir it constantly for about one minute. And it's gonna take a little while for this to stir up, but we're gonna stir this until it comes to a rolling boil mm. for one minute. Now, let me tell you a little bit. I did some experimenting. The other day I tried a recipe that said no boil strawberry jam. And I said, okay, okay that sounds easy. <laughs> so I ladled it into the jars, put it into the refrigerator, and the next day it looked like sugar. It just, it was, <laughs> and the recipe did call for wow. a lot of sugar. And I thought, I'm going to save this jam. So I poured everything back into the pot. Okay. And I let the strawberries cook down for a few, about one minute. Put it back in the jars, and it's beautiful. Wow. It is really, really what a pretty. That made, then. It made a huge hmm. difference. And this was using about five cups of sugar to wow. three cups of strawberries. Wow. So you wow. see, uh, five cups of sugar. Uh, wow. We have so many people with diabetes. Right. We, right. I don't want to tell them to go for this. Right. Then this, which is what we'll be sampling in a little bit. This is our low sugar pectin, and you see the difference between the two. You can tell this is a much sure deeper can. red, and then this mm -hmm. looks a little bit lighter. And we used, um, I think it was about five cups of sugar to three cups of berries for this. Okay. So we've got our sugar. We need to add our sugar after this comes to a rolling boil. But let's talk about some of the advantages in doing strawberry freezer jam. One advantage is it can be ready right away. Okay. And you know, whenever we're using the hot water, um, the water bath method, you have to seal the jars. If we're gonna put these in the refrigerator or the freezer, you don't have to worry so much about the lids sealing, although okay. we are heating the jars to 180 degrees so that they will seal. Okay. Uh, it's also, like we said, the berries seem to be fresher, they're a brighter color, easy to do. However, 
if we don't process this in a hot water bath, we're going to have to put them in the refrigerator for no longer than three weeks. So oh. you've got to hurry up and eat it, okay. or you can put it in the freezer for up to three months. Some people say, okay, now oh, this go. is what, let's okay. time it for one minute. Got to time it for one minute. Can you help me with that, Chris? I okay. can barely see this. So we're going to let this boil for one minute. The disadvantage here is who has that much freezer space? <laughs> You know, you hate right. to, to open your freezer and say, tw see 24 cans of <laughs> right. strawberry jam. What I have done with my previous batches, I gave it away immediately. Okay. You know, I just gave That's it away smart. to friends and family. Yeah, I like strawberries, but mm -hmm. yeah, I saw uh, 24. So yeah. you, yeah. Need, right. you need a whole lot of room. So let's just go ahead, get this to cook down for one minute. Okay, you got about 30 seconds. It says stir constantly. You don't want it to stick. All right. Okay. Now, if I were at home, I could adjust the heat a little bit better, and it would be a hard rolling boil. But we're, in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to the next step where we add one half cup of sugar. Yeah. So I've got one and a third cups of berries, one half cup of sugar. That still sounds like a lot, doesn't mm, it? it? Does. But that's it does. okay because otherwise we would have a whole lot more than that. And it's smelling good already. Oh, I love I the way smell it that. smells. Yeah. It makes the kitchen smell really good. Mm -hmm. But you know what else we're going to add to it? Jelly ha and jam has a tendency ah, to foam up. Butter. So I'm going to add like maybe a half of a teaspoon. Wow, that's a little and bit of Just butter. a tiny bit. And this should cut down on the foaming. Ah. Because you don't want to have a jar of foam in your jam. Okay. Would you say it's come to another hard boil? Uh -huh. I think it's boiling. Let's go ahead and start okay. timing it one minute. Okay. okay. You got five. Okay, it's looking good. All right. Good, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's coming to a good boil. Yeah, that's coming to a good boil. Excuse me, Tanya. Now we're going to take out our jars. Now remember, we said we had to heat our jars because if we don't and you put that hot product in a cold jar, it will crack the jar. Uh, so we're just going to spoon this in. I'll tell you, doesn't that smell good? It does. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's boiling away. And we want to leave about one half inch of head space. Okay. If you go on YouTube, people use no head space, or they <laughs> might use an inch and a half. And we want to go ahead and use our bubbler, get those air bubbles out. Now we have our lids that have been heated to 180 degrees. We're going to lift this off. Oh wait, I've got to wipe this first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to wipe your lid. See, you don't want any residue okay. on the lid. Okay. And you put your lid on. This is a real good lesson here. <laughs> And then you just screw this on fingertip tight. Fingertip. Yeah, okay. fingertip tight. And we've got jam. How about that? Wow, that didn't seem yeah. hard at all. Okay, yeah. and you see, it looks like the fruit has come to the top of the right. of the jar. So we're going to let this stand at room temperature until it's cool enough for us to put it in the refrigerator. And like we said, you can keep it in the refrigerator for three weeks or your freezer up to three months. Okay. Now, many of the publications I've read have said you can keep it in the freezer up to one year. I don't think you can do that for the low sugar jam. Okay. Maybe you, you know, if we had a lot of sugar in this, but I would not use it for this jam. Okay. But since we have got some angel food cake, oh, oh, oh. and I know someone had a birthday recently. Well, <laughs> yeah. oh, well, that's right on time. Yeah. Oh, We're going to have some birthday cake. Tony didn't know that was going to happen today, yeah. did she? Did you know it was her birthday? I did. Yeah. I sure did. Okay. You get the first piece because okay. you're the birthday Thank girl. you. Oh, yeah. And we strawberry is my favorite. Oh, yeah, see, I there you go. I love strawberries. Oh, I'm so Absolutely glad. Love strawberries. Okay. Well, we have this. Yeah, I can okay. eat strawberries any time yes. of the year. Let that cool because it's very, very Thank hot. Thank you so much. You are quite Happy welcome. birthday, Tanya. Well, we supplies yeah. for you today. Yeah. I mean, Facebook is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> keep up it with It's really good. We keep up with our friends. Okay, Chris, I'll cut a slice for you. Oh, Mr. D is going to be so jealous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Let me fix this. Okay. 
Thank you for that demonstration. Oh, you're quite that welcome. It was so yeah. easy. Easy. Mm -hmm. It was quick. Tanya. Thank you. I may even I, I may even have to try to make some in my kitchen. Okay. Yeah. You have it. Thank brave. you again, Miss Kathy. You're quite welcome, mm -hmm. Chris. We appreciate that. You're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Tanya, let's talk a little bit about wildlife-friendly gardens. Okay. All right, so here's, I got a couple of questions for you about okay. that. What kind of wildlife can you attract in an urban setting? Well, when we think about wildlife in an urban setting, mostly we're trying to attract all different kinds of birds. Okay. Uh, anything from robins and mockingbirds to hummingbirds, but mm. also butterfly gardening is very popular. Yes. And yes. gardening for bees, other pollinators, and even bats. Bats? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can build bat boxes. I'm seeing those all around town now, especially at Shelby Farms. Yeah. So how about that? Okay. So how do we attract these species to our own properties, though? Well, they all need food, water, and shelter, just okay. like people. Right. So uh, you can go a long way to providing that habitat with the plants that you put into your yard. And then you can supplement with also um, things like bird baths and other mm -hmm. ways to get water into your yard and um, bird feeders, that type of thing. Okay, so speaking of bird feeders, how do you attract the birds? Okay, well, before we think of feeder, let's think of first using plants. Ah, okay. And you wanna use your entire yard. So not only are you gonna plant just understory or maybe just nut trees, but you wanna plant different levels. So your main larger trees like oaks mm -hmm. and hickories, and then you wanna plant something in the understory it could be dogwoods all the way down to your perennials because different species of birds utilize different heights of trees. So some like to stay high up in the canopies, others like to perch and nest closer to the ground. Mm -hmm. So you think about the whole um, vertical thing that you have to work with in your yard. And it's not just right there on the ground. Now for trees, you need to plant things that uh, have nuts or fruits that they can eat, okay, like sure. um, American holly, American beech, Black gums, crab apples, um, okay. flowering dogwoods, hawthorns, hickories, oak trees for mast. Okay. But you don't want to only plant deciduous trees because they need thermal cover in the winter to keep warm. Uh -huh. So you want to plant some evergreens too okay. to keep them warm in the winter. For shrubs, you can do things like common juniper that has berries and hollies, pyracantha, yeah. spice bush, sumac, any kind of sumac, viburnum has a berries they can eat okay. and then for vines um, trumpet honeysuckle trumpet creeper virginia creeper wild grapes american bittersweet so there's lots of things you can plant for them to eat wow. and then you can also supplement with um, your bird feeders a lot of things like to eat sunflower seeds sure. fragile sunflower seeds sure. um, you can also use fresh fruits uh, that you might have left over maybe they're starting to go um, there's a lot of birds that like to eat yeah, uh, orange slices, apple slices, <laughs> pieces of banana. You can just leave right. them on the ground or for them, and they'll come and eat and those. They come get them. Okay. And then some bird species really like suet, oh, so yeah. you can buy or make suet, mm -hmm. and especially woodpeckers and chickadees. Okay. And your mockingbirds and robins like the fruit. Okay. Now, what exactly is suet? Well, um, it's usually sold in cakes, where you can make it. It's made out of fat product okay. um, mixed with usually peanut butter or oats and oh. some seeds and stuff in there. There's lots of different suet recipes on the internet that okay. you can look up or you can just buy it um, at the store. Okay, I've seen it at the store. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. The birds are eating it all, huh? Yeah. yeah. Fruits and vegetables that are <laughs> high in vitamins and nutrition. How yeah. about that? Yeah, different birds like different foods. Yeah, good mm -hmm. stuff. All right, so what can we plant to encourage the butterflies, though? I mean, because that's big now. Yes, We want to attract those butterflies in. Well, you have to think uh, two different ways for butterfly gardening. You need to plant something for the larval stages uh, to eat, right. the caterpillars. Good point. Yeah. And caterpillars are very, very particular about what they will eat. So different caterpillars will eat different foods. Um, so if you're trying to attract monarch butterflies, mm. then you have to plant milkweed because that's the only thing that they'll eat is milkweed. Okay. So um, you can also plant for zebra swallowtail pawpaws. They like young yeah. pawpaw trees. Um, and then our eastern black swallowtail larvae, 
they like things in the carrot family. So okay. carrot, dill, parsley, parsley, celery, and they are voracious eaters. <laughs> <laughs> Would you know that from experience? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. They can clear out some parsley real, real fast. But if you're trying to attract them, you know, maybe make a space specifically for them, you know, to eat okay. what you plant. So okay. it, it's really inexpensive to buy herb seeds and plant for them. Now for the, their adult stage, mm -hmm. they drink nectar. And so there's a lot of plants we can put in our yards for the nectar. Okay. And not only the butterflies, but also hummingbirds are yeah. gonna be attracted to these nectar plants too. Okay. Things like aster, azalea, bee balm, um, butterfly bush, of course the milkweeds, they like all kinds of clover, columbine, which is good for shadier yeah. spots, um, coneflower, lobelia, phlox, also good mm -hmm. for shade. So you can butterfly garden if you even if you have some shade. Salvia, Wajila, and Zinnia. Zinnia is super easy to grow from seed. Yes. I grow that yes. some of that every year. So okay. those are some plants for your butterflies. That's some good stuff, Tanya. Uh, so, and of course, if people want to plant these plants for their butterflies, they're easy to maintain for the most part? Yes, and okay. readily available. Yeah, phlox okay. and salvia, Zinnia, those are easy things, yes. Okay. And you may even have uh, azalea in your yard already, so who right. knows? And most people do. Yeah. Most people do. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, good stuff. Now, how about this next question? Attracting bees, right? Mm -hmm. Bees are popular as well. You know, we have a large beekeeper society here yes. uh, in Memphis, mm -hmm. and you hear more and more people are interested in bees. Uh -huh. So how do we attract the bees? Well, they like yards? some of these same nectar plants, okay. any kind of plant, but they really like um, blue and yellow flowers, according ah. to the research. Okay. So they're mm -hmm. attracted to those, but I mean, they'll love your zinnias, any, any kind of color that, that they can get. Right. So uh, plant, for your uh, bees in that way. And also, if you wanna have a place for them to lay eggs so that mm -hmm. you get more bees in the future, your solitary bees are the kind that they don't have a big hive where they lay all their, their eggs. Okay. Your solitary bees um, will use things like hollowed stems from hydrangeas or yeah. brambles, okay. If, okay. as long as you don't prune them all the way back. So okay. leave hollow stems when you have them uh, for them to use to lay their eggs in. And you can also buy those bee motel things. Yeah, I've but seen those. <laughs> the only thing, though, is you have to be prepared to throw those away after a year or so because um, you don't want that many bees and a different species living that close together because okay. um, disease problems can be uh, come up with that. Sure. But you can make your own little nesting place for your bees if you have a wooden block, three to five inch thick wooden block, and you drill holes about three quarters of an inch apart anywhere from an eighth of an inch in diameter to five sixteenths of an inch diameter, and you drill 90% of the way through that block, that three to five inch block, and they will come along and um, lay their eggs. How about that? And they'll seal off, they'll lay an egg, and they'll put bee bread in there that they make out of like pollen and nectar and uh, for the egg when the larva hatches for it to eat. And then um, they'll seal that off, and then they'll just lay several in a row in those channels that you, uh, drilled out so those are but you want to hang that from like the under the eave of your house okay. or under the eave of your shed and not in direct sunlight okay, so you can provide direct. a home for them now for um, birds there's all different kinds of bird boxes that you can make or buy but different kinds of birds are very specific about the size of hole the entrance mm. hole in the boxes um, so you probably need to go online and um, look for exact dimensions on bird boxes Tell you, we can tell you're passionate about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's some good information, mm -hmm. some stuff I didn't even yeah. know myself. So thank you much for that information. And we hope more people will actually garden for wildlife. Mm -hmm. So thank you much. Thank you. There's lots of different mulches you can use on tomato plants. And what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna use newspaper, which is a really cheap mulch and has some advantages. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do, I tend to use two layers of newspaper. It makes it last the whole season since it does break down through the year. Um, to get it around your plants, it's nice because you can just rip it how you want it to be and just kind of tuck it around the base of the plant. If it's windy at all, the one downside of putting this out is you have to weigh it down. So we're gonna put down some, some dirt clods here just temporarily to hold it so it doesn't blow away. Then you just continue spreading it out. The way to really get it to stay down is just to water the paper. And that'll just get it wet, kind of get it to stick to the dirt. Now this plant is mulched, it was free. 
you can go to your local grocery store and just pick up the free paper and use that. One of the reasons for mulching tomato plants is to keep the uh, fungus from splashing off the dirt back onto the plants. You want to take the dirt off and just let the wet water hold it down and you should be good to go. This should last about one season. When you're done, you can just till it back into the ground. All right, here's our Q&A session. Miss Kathy, if you had anything to say, you jump in there with us, all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, here's our first via email. Is this a weed or a wild flower? Several came up in my backyard. This is from Miss Linda. So, Tanya, is this a weed or a wild flower? And it depends, it's right? In the wild eyes flower of the could, right. It, yes. It just depends, right? If you like it, put it somewhere that you want it to grow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you'd be just fine, right? Uh -huh. All right. So, what, what do you think that is? It's a butterweed. It's in the butterweed. aster family. Right. Mm -hmm. It's butterweed. Uh, it goes by another name, uh, crest leaf ground sale mm -hmm. is what I actually know it by. Beautiful flower though. Yeah. It's, uh, it's actually a winter annual. You know, mm -hmm. it forms a rosette of leaves first uh, throughout the winter months. And then of course the spring gets here. Here comes the rest of the plant. Again, beautiful flowers. It has a little yellow disc in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. surrounded by the petals. Uh, I actually like it. I think it's yeah. nice. You see feels of it. You know, uh, of course now I've seen some over at uh, Shelby Farms. Uh, you see them near ditches because they like moist soils. Mm. Okay. And anytime you have wet springs, you see more of these. And guess what we had? A wet spring, wet spring yeah. Which is why mm -hmm. we're seeing them all over the place. Mm, neat. All right. So there may be something for, for bees, maybe? Yeah. I'm sure bees would use it. Yeah, mm -hmm. bees would use that. Yeah. So uh, there you have it, Miss Linda. All right. Butterweed or crest leaf ground cell. And beauty's in the eye to behold, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I moved last year to our new home. I would like to start a strawberry bed again. Since plants would be more expensive, I would like to get the bare root strawberries. Every time I've planted them, they did not do well. How do you grow bare root strawberries and make them survive? Thanks, and this is from Miss Linda. So, strawberries. Well, um, hmm. bare root strawberries. I would say the key is to make sure they don't get dried out before planting. Aye. You want to soak them in water before mm -hmm. you plant. Plant them in moist soil and then water them in really well. You don't want to let those bare root plants mm -hmm. get dry. Oh, that, that, that's it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want the roots to dry out. Uh, good sunny location, mm -hmm. well-drained soils. Uh, and I'm trying to think of what else Mr. D, you know, he, of course he talked about this once upon a time. The pH, he would mm -hmm. say you need a pH between 6.0 and I think it's 6.5. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but don't let them dry out. And something else, when you put them in the ground, don't cover the crown up with soil. Right. Mm -hmm. It can rot them, mm -hmm. all right. So you definitely don't want to do that. So I hope that helps you out, Miss Linda. Yeah, just yeah, keep those roots nice and moist. Don't let them dry out, and you get those bare root strawberries you want, all right. And let me mention again, I do like strawberries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to make sure that you get some mm -hmm. good strawberries, Miss Linda. All right. Here's our next viewer email. What are the black spots on my potato leaves, and how do I control this issue? And this is from Joey via YouTube. So he has black spots on his potato leaves. Any, any ideas about that? Could time? be a fungal disease. Ah, that's the first thing I thought. Yeah, potatoes and tomatoes are in the same family, mm -hmm. and whatever fungal disease a tomato will get, so <laughs> right. will a potato. So will a potato. So it could be early blight, but we really don't know without seeing a picture. True, true. Um, Good point. Yeah, yeah, so it's probably a fungal disease. For that, we recommend crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So. Don't plant your potatoes, tomatoes, or eggplants. Eggplants right. are in the same family. Don't plant them in the same spot year after year. Um, you want to put them on a three or four year rotation in the, out of that spot mm -hmm. in case the, some fungal diseases are soil borne. So you don't want that to get in your soil. Um, right. And then also preventative fungicide sprays. So if you already have the spots, a fungicide spray is not going to fix the spots that you yeah. have. Yeah. It only prevents it from spreading getting worse. Okay. So preventative fungicide sprays. Right. And something else I like to throw in, resistant varieties. Yes. If those are out there, use those. All right. So we hope that helps you out. Uh, here's our next email. Can you cut off part of an iris tuber with a knife to thin out your plants without digging up the whole plant? And this is from Jim. So he wants to cut it off with a knife to thin it out without digging up the whole plant. Can you do that? Yes, you okay. can. You can. Okay. Yes. Um, if you're not concerned with trying to save what you've cut off and put it somewhere else, huh. if all you want to do is thin, and one of the reasons you may want to thin your irises is they will grow close together and crowd each other and you, yeah. they won't bloom. 
So if you find that your iris, if they're in full sun, they need full sun. If they're okay. in full sun, Good. but they're not blooming, they're probably too crowded. And so you can either divide them, dig them all up and divide them, but that's a whole, whole lot of work. So if you don't, <laughs> okay. if you don't want to do that and you're right. not real concerned about losing one here or there, or whatever, because they're crowded, right. then yes, you can take a long, sharp knife and go in there and thin them out that way. Wow. There you have it, Mr. Jim. I learned something with that one. All right. That's Tanya. All right. So, Miss Kathy, tell you we're out of time. That was fun. All right. Thank All you right. so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want Kathy's recipe for strawberry freezer jam or to get more information about attracting wildlife, head over to familyplotgarden.com. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.